all of a sudden everybody's winning because one of the things that's really wild is that all of the things that I'm lousy at doing, scheduling, insurance work, there are people that love it and are great at it. And so by empowering those people to do the things that I wasn't any good at, it allowed me to do those things that I loved, like playing with the customers and asking them questions and creating sort of a little micro first within my workspace and, of course, this kind of thing. You can't imagine how fired up I get when you and I are speaking that I'm going to take this into my work tomorrow. This energy is going to last just from talking mm -hmm. to you and, and, and your incredible audience. This energy is going to last me days. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, every single person listening to this podcast is making a difference. The key is, is it a positive one or a negative one? And how do you really, really see your life? And how do you see life events? It was interesting. Today's guest, Corey Janke, has written a book called The Successful Thinker. And it's how we think about things. It's how we see things. And, you know, do you... It really does come down to, are you being optimistic or are you being pessimistic? And even though the identical event is occurring, somebody can look at it and they can make something positive out of it, or at least they won't go down a negative trail. So my encouragement is, is that you would really, really engage uh, this session as uh, Corey and I have a conversation about his book and the seven laws that he has covered in his book. And he's friends with one of our previous guests, uh, Bob Berg, who has the Go-Giver um, series, and, you know, Bob's pretty uh, well-known in the marketplace with his podcast, and he was, I think, a guest with us for over a couple of years ago. Now, with that, one of the things I encourage you is that, you know, life can be very stressful if you don't know who you are, if you're not clear about your vision, if you haven't defined that. And, you know, don't beat yourself up if you don't know what that is. But take the steps to learn to grow. And even our guest today, Corey, talked about reading about an hour a day, which is about um, a book a week for years and years to grow and become um, you know, more than uh, what he was earlier. So my encouragement is that CRG really has a whole series of online courses. The one that we're focusing on for uh, this term is around what do you really value. It is actually one of my favorite courses because when you go through the values assessment, it helps you to make 300 decisions in a very quick order of time to say, you know what, what is most important to you? And if you're making situational decisions, it's nearly impossible to get it right. But what would it mean if you could make the right decision every time? And it's a play on words, but it's very close to what would really happen if you knew what your core values are and then made values-based decisions, and that's what that course will do for you or the assessment will do for you. So the link is there. It's what do you really value, and it's an online course that CRG has for you. So thank you, as always, for being a listener, for spending your time with us. If you like what we're doing, please pass it on, share it, leave a positive comment on whatever platform you're listening on. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes, and here's our show with Corey Yankee. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, when we think about life, we all can be accused of thinking or not thinking. And interestingly enough, we have an author of a, his new book, The Successful Thinker Book. So welcome to the show, Corey Janke. Corey, thanks for uh, joining us on Secrets of Success. Well, thank you so much, my friend. We're going to have a really, really good time today talking about how does my life look and how do I think it looks? Well, I mean, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, I mean, that's the space that we're in all the time. And so I really, really appreciate that. Now, Corey, just before we got on the show, you are in Wisconsin and um, just wanted to get a sense of your background if you've, as you said, you've listened to some of our shows and our Secrets of Success podcast. Listeners know that we always go into story before we get into your expertise and book. 
So, uh, Corey, where, did, where was growing up for you and what was kind of like your earlier years like? Okay, so I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and I grew up about 15 minutes from O'Hare Airport, which meant that all day, every day, trains are going by, planes are going overhead, and you really had this sense that life was all about being busy. And, and what I learned really quickly is that most people mistake busyness for success. What I found is those people are genuinely relatively unhappy because they don't really define for themselves a who is Ken Keyes? Who am I and what was I brought to this world to do? So one of the things that really drives me is to help people find out who they are and really what they were put on this planet to do with their lives. Oh, excellent, excellent. Now, when we think about your growing up years, what was, you know, what did your parents do? What was sort of their professions and what was family life like? Okay, so my parents grew up eating dirt. My dad was the oldest of 13 from a very, very poor family. He, in fact, he uh, would go ahead and hitchhike to the golf course when he was around 11 or 12 years old just to put food on the family table. And my mom grew up in northern Wisconsin where I live now and she was one of 14 children and grandma and grandpa took in five or six of my grandfather's uh, nieces and nephews because his brother passed away at, at a young age and, and so they really grew up learning how to share how to make something from nothing and uh, my father what he did, it still fascinates me to this day. He worked about 55 hours in a cardboard box factory and then put himself through college uh, when I was just a small boy. And he got straight A's because he studied on the train, and that was the only time he had to study, but he was totally focused. One of the nicest people you'll ever, ever meet. And uh, my mom, you know, she supported us when we were kids by taking care of us and taking care of dad. And then when the time came to where I was old enough to take care of my brothers. My mom worked nights developing film when film was a thing, you know, and she worked nights and she worked dozens and dozens of hours uh, a week. And, uh, you know, I watched these two people work super hard to put myself and my brothers through school. And then they went ahead and put my dad through uh, master school. So my dad got his master's when he was in his 50s. So what you'll never be able to convince me of is that success isn't possible for you, whoever you are, because I watched people who ate dirt growing up put a life together. And you know what's really funny about it, Ken? Mm. My, dad, my dad just turned 80-something, and I think for the first time in their lives, they became totally debt-free when he was about 78. So, I mean, wow. they worked on life all of their life and I'll tell you my mom tells me that their biggest fight happened to be when she was out of cigarettes way back when and my dad loaned his last two dollars to a guy at work because he needed it more than my dad did well wow. well wow. so you'd if you think about your family reunions with 13 on one side and 14 on the other uh, that's pretty well up to renting a football stadium is it not Oh, it's absolutely uh, incredible. My my wife and I actually got married at one of the family reunions. Uh, my my Aunt Lois put together a, a family reunion for my mom's family for 27 straight years. And I lived uh, just a couple miles from it, and I went for 27 years. And one of the things that's funny that you now that you mention it is – at one of the family reunions, the title for my first book, We Are Not Here at Rehearsal, uh, was born because of a story one of my uncles told me. Wow. So here you are. You're growing up. You certainly observed uh, hard work, dedication. Uh, you mentioned your dad was not miserable. He was this nicest guy. So what was it like for you to be in the midst of this as a teenager growing up? What were some of the emotions you were going through? Well, it was really interesting because at the time, you know, you're a teenager and you don't understand that your parents are two people trying to figure it out, right? And I think one of the things that happened for a long, long time is there was some resentment in, in my heart and my head because I spent a large part of my uh, formative years taking care of my brothers. And now, as I've gotten to really know my parents as people, 
I cherished those times. And uh, it was a very interesting thing. About a month or so ago, my father was airlifted to a local hospital. So my brothers had uh, driven up here because I uh, probably neglected to mention my parents have retired very close to where I live. Mm. And uh, my two brothers drove up here. And with COVID, uh, my brothers and I weren't allowed to go into the hospital. Uh, we were essentially a support system for mom. So we spent quite a bit of time together really getting to reconnect. And you know what you find is that you have a lot more in common with your siblings than you think you do. And there again, it's the way you think about your relationships that essentially form those relationships. And I think what I learned during that whole experience is that everyone has input that they're using, like you said, from past experience, from present circumstances, that they're using to drive the way they think about things. And I think we could all sometimes take a step back and realize, you know what, if I look for a deeper understanding of where is this person coming from and what drives them, Mm. you find that you're more alike people than you think you are. Oh, for sure, for sure. So now you've finished uh, high school. Uh, what did you do after that, uh, Corey? Well, you know, I was lucky in that my father had driven education into my brain ever since I was a small, small child. I remember getting five D's when I was in fifth grade, and my father, as busy as he was, dedicated himself every night to a lecture about how you didn't want to become a ditch digger with your life. And it was so funny because I didn't know that there were people that were ditch diggers, you know, that in a certain time in American history, they were paid to use a shovel to dig ditches for our highways. Uh, But I didn't want to be hassled and I didn't want to be lectured. So uh, I worked really hard in school, if nothing else, to please my father. And then when I got out of high school, my dad and my mom They sacrificed a lot so I could go to college, and I went to college in Des Moines, Iowa, essentially because you're a teenage kid and you want to get away from home, right? And uh, (laughs) Were you one of the party guys or not? uh, Absolutely not. I uh, was one of those guys that had to work every minute you weren't in school to pay for your part of school, and I actually worked my way through school as a sports official. Wow. And what sport did you officiate that you were best at or enjoyed the most? Well, you know, I I enjoyed the most uh, basketball because it was the most active and it was the most rewarding, but it was also the most physically punishing. I think there was at one point 26 or 27 games I was doing a week for high school, park district, uh, school intramurals. And I'll tell you, I remember there was a day when a guy, huge guy, way bigger than me, walked up to me and he said, you suck. And I remember at that moment, something inside of me said, no, I don't. And that was the day that turned my life around because I realized that, you know what, people are going to tell you things in your life and it's up to you whether you believe them or don't believe them. And it was that experience that drove my professional experience as a pharmacist Uh, because that's what I ended up doing. I ended up graduating and moving to northern Wisconsin to become a pharmacist. And all of a sudden, we're 30 years out from that. But, you know, it's the same kind of a thing as officiating a basketball game, right? Things are going on in your life moment to moment, and you always have a thing that happens, right? What, Mm -hmm. What Stephen Covey called a precipitating event. And it's up to us to lengthen the space between when an event happens and how we respond to it. And the more we can lengthen that space and actually separate ourselves from the event that's causing the space, the more we have a better chance to respond the way we want to respond and the way that makes ourselves and the people that know us proud. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And when you think about time and space, it's this difference of responding versus reacting. And how can I kind of be in check with my emotions and how I'm doing and be thoughtful about it, which is, you know, comes back to your book around uh, thinking. Now, where did pharmacy fit into this whole picture? I think the honest to God truth is that my father worked as an accountant and my father would work and work and work at work. And then he would bring piles and piles of work home. And I wanted a job when I was 17 or 18 that, you didn't have to do at home. I wanted a job that when the store closed, you were done. And I I Mm -hmm. coincidentally was working as a stock boy in a local drugstore when I was 16. 
and I really admired the two guys that ran it. And I thought, wow, pharmacy is a perfect deal, right? Because you go, you work really hard, you provide service to people, and then when the store closes, you're done. And so I went to pharmacy school in, in Des Moines, Iowa, and I tell you, it fit me perfectly because over the course of watching my parents and learning uh, from this large, large family, I just developed an incredible love for humanity and for people. One of the things my father is, is an incredible philosopher. He really, really studied as a way to, I think, escape from the rough circumstances that he grew up in. And he told me so many things that really have added value to my life that I don't think he ever really fully realized he did. For example, mm-hmm. one, of the things my, one of the things my dad told me was, you know what, Ken, you don't have to tell people how great you are. Just be great, really, really great, and they will tell you. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was my guiding principle throughout my whole life so far. And one of the things that I found is that you don't even care that people tell you if you're great because what happens is that when you work on really adding value and really adding service and really doing a good, good job, those are the rewards that pay themselves back to you that you never even knew were available, right? We always work for money. We always work for status. And what we find is those things are empty. But a good feeling of personal power and self-satisfaction, I swear, will add more value to your life than anything you could buy at the store or check out on Amazon. Mm. Uh, Adding value, but to making a contribution, making a difference, and all the, the verbs that kind of go with that one. Now, Corey, you have now moved into this space of being a leadership coach for many years, and you mentioned you had written another book before. Uh, How did you transition from that into getting into this sort of formal uh, coaching and training and development side of things? Well, you know, it was really weird. You asked me why I got into pharmacy, and at the time I didn't know that it was a good choice for me. What happened was you know, my dad said, if you want to if you want to be successful in life and you don't want to dig ditches, you go to school. So about the time I was graduating and everybody was offering me a job, it seemed like dad went from just, uh, you know, everybody else's father when they're a teenager to a pretty smart guy. But the first day I worked in the pharmacy, I spent a whole shift standing there going, sir, take this medicine with food. Sir, take this medicine on an empty stomach. Sir, don't take these two medicines together. And I remember as I was walking home from my work that day, I thought to myself, if I got to do this for 45 more years, I'm going to go insane. And so I said Hmm. to myself, how can I do my job differently? How can I make a difference? And I went to work the next day. You know, I'm 23 years old. I'm cocky. I'm confident. And I'm bulletproof. So I went into work the next day, and a guy was standing there with a cast, and I said, dude, what did you do to your leg? Oh, man, you can't believe what I did to my leg. And he started telling me the story. And the next lady that walked up, I said, wow, that is a cool T-shirt. Tell me where you got that T-shirt. And all of a sudden, she started telling me about the T-shirt and things, right? And so I started realizing that I could have a lot of fun just getting to know people. You know, at the time, there wasn't such a thing as relationship marketing. So this is what we did. And what happened was that I started recognizing that some people looked really, really successful. And I would say, Ken, tell me, you look really, really successful. What is it that you do and and how have you become successful? And then he would share tips and tricks and and things that were working. But at the same time, talk about a captive audience for you to find out from others every day. You had this audience that you could uh, find these answers to. That's pretty cool. It was fun, and and, you know what was also interesting is there was no podcast. There was only like audio programs if you wanted to learn outside of work, right? So they would tell me these things, but at the same time, I would also notice, dude, you, you look like life is really beating you up. What's going on? And then he would tell me, you know, about his struggles and his, his trials, his tribulations, and so forth. And I started developing a passion for the people that were getting killed in life. So you got all these people that are killing it, and you got all these people that are getting killed. And what I noticed is there were common denominators on both sides. And so what I wanted to do my whole life is to really help the people that are getting killed use the information from the people that are killing it 
so that everybody could win. Because one of the things that one of the most successful people told me was, you know, everybody thinks that there's sort of this limit on resources, on resources, a uh, limit on abundance, and there's not. There are more resources falling out of the sky. There's more money lining the streets of America, and people just don't know enough to bend over and pick it up. Mm. And so once I got that, and once I recognized that nothing I could buy, nothing that I could do, no place that I could go could add value to me than sharing information with people who don't have information, I, I, it's, I live a life every day that most people only dream about because I wake up happy and grateful and so forth. But it wasn't always like that because there were times in my career where I woke up with my blood pressure way too high and my heart rate way too high from the stress and pressure of filling 500 prescriptions a day and trying to manage all of the corporate things. And so what I ended up doing was actually going back to the information that people had given me and figuring out, you know what, you have a choice how you manage your life. You can be part of the rat race or you can make your own rules. Even, even, and I'll, I swear this is true, even within that corporate landscape. Mm. So what did you end up doing to sort of free yourself from that, um, that stress? Okay, so one of the things that was really a gift to me was when the guy told me that what he does is he reads a book a day, or excuse me, he reads an hour a day, which allows him to read about a book a week. So he had given me the suggestion to read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Hence your reference to Stephen Covey, and Covey earlier. <laughs> right. And if you do that, what that also does is it teaches you about, you know what, if you want to be more, do more, have more, create abundance in your life, you have to become more. So it taught me that if I could develop myself first, and then I could develop my team members, I could create this sort of a synergy that allowed me to spend time at my job doing the things that I love to do, mm. and then I could delegate the things that I didn't love to do and that I sucked at, and all of a sudden everybody's winning. Because one of the things that's really wild is that all of the things that I'm lousy at doing, scheduling, insurance work. There are people that love it and are great at it. And so by empowering those people to do the things that I wasn't any good at, it allowed me to do those things that I loved, like playing with the customers and asking them questions and creating sort of a little microverse within my workspace. And, and of course, this kind of thing. You can't imagine how fired up I get when you and I are speaking that I'm going to take this into my work tomorrow this energy is going to last just from talking mm -hmm. to you and, and, and your incredible audience. This energy is going to last me days. And I don't think most people really, really commit themselves to the things that build them back up. I believe, mm. I believe there's an erosion of confidence in our country. And I believe that one of the ways that we, we can work with that is to recognize those things that make you uniquely you, those things that really build you up, you were put here to do. And if you're not doing them, of course you're going to burn out. Of course you're going to fatigue. Mm -hmm. Of course you're going to be emotionally exhausted. What have you found works for you to fire you up? Well, I mean, this the research, Corey, not dissimilar to what you're saying there, is you really become like the five closest friends. The other one is, is like, who are you hanging out with? You know, I know if I get stuck into social media, into the negative stuff there, that can suck your brains out in about two seconds, right? <laughs> oh, so, you know, what you're, what you're putting in is also what you're putting out. So you have to be, I'm pretty, oh, what's the word, discerning about what I'm going to listen to in terms of podcasts. Uh, we don't have, we don't listen to the news. We don't have TV per se. We stream. So those are some of the, where I'm controlling the environment, like you said, deciding what I'm going to let in and what I'm not. The other thing is, is interesting enough, is this, these are energizing for me too, because I always block my podcast recordings into a day. And so I've already had great interviews today with other experts like yourself. And it's, it's just always interesting where you learn. And I've done 250 shows. 
So you have a lot of people that you'll learn from. So Corey, it is who you hang out with. And if you're around a whiner, blainer, complainer, well, then you don't be surprised you're going to be like that. Oh, that's so well said, because one of the things that most people don't recognize is who's nudging them off course. I mm-hmm. think Jim, Jim Rohn was talking about that most people won't push you off course. They'll nudge you off course. And I love the way you said that you become kind of the aggregate of the five people that you're around the most. And the other thing that I find fascinating is someone is around you and you're really responsible for the influence that you have on them. Mm. How are you affecting people's course? And that's one of the things that I really wanted to pay it forward from my father and my mother who worked so hard to make me the person that I am and my brothers the same way and their grandchildren. I mean, what kind Mm -hmm. of a son would I be if I took that information and influence they gave me and drove other people into the ground through complaining and whining about problems that really, compared to what some people are facing in the world, are really quite minor? Mm. Well, I think you're you're making a point about um, it's so important to be so careful about what you let in, and nowadays... Uh, and I don't want to be a broad stroke brush, but there's not much media that you want to listen to. Uh, it just is so destructive and draining. Now, I don't want to get distracted there because you're my guest and uh, or our guest here with the Secrets of Success individual. So, Corey, when did you turn this sort of into a profession? Uh, are you still doing the pharmacy or did you leave that? Absolutely. So I work 40 hours a week as a pharmacy manager for a CVS and I love, love, love that part of my job because what happens is that when I'm talking to someone and they tell me you don't understand, I'm telling them that the solutions that I provide in the successful thinker about how to engage with people, how to empower your team, how to get patient outcomes, how to get management outcomes, how to get employee buy-in, they are coming from real world things that I do every day. We're not talking philosophy. We're not talking conjecture. We're talking about things that I do every day that get the results that have won me awards that I'm I, I too humble to say, but have won me awards that most pharmacists would covet. And it's not because I won the awards. It's because the people that I surround myself with and empower and engage have freed me up to do the things that I do best. I really only do three things in the pharmacy. The first is that I work to drive patient outcomes and customer relations. The second is that I work to develop and empower my employees. And the third is that I network with the important people in our industry, the doctors and the nurses at the clinics. The people that I work with do everything else. And I think it's really, really important that we focus on those things that we do well because if we don't, then what we do is we dilute our effectiveness. Mm. And so what I do is I had to make a decision. What are you going to do on your day off? And my family is truly, I have a wife and a son who just turned 18 this past weekend, truly supportive of the idea that when dad is off work, he allocates a certain amount of time to writing to his own podcast, to showing up on other podcasts to spread the message that, you know what, life is wonderful. Life is abundant. Life is great. Or life is miserable. Life is lousy. It all depends on how you choose to approach it and what you choose to focus on. Mm. And so while I used, I love to golf and I love to – hang out on the porch in the patio, I'm always constantly focused on that allocation of time to this sort of, we'll call it a side endeavor. And my hope is to someday transition to where I'm a full-time author, full-time podcaster, and so forth. But for now, it's really fulfilling because I'm able to be young enough and strong enough to do both and really focus on the things that really light me up and light my family up. Mm, Excellent, Corey. Well, I think one of the things you're saying and demonstrating that if what you're doing is energizing, you have way more energy 
to really bring to life. If you're doing stuff that makes you miserable or it's not playing to your strengths, then for sure you can't have the same engagement level that you're having. So with that, I want to transition into what really drove the writing of the book, The Successful Thinker. Okay, you know, and that's a wonderful question. I'm really glad you asked it because here's the truth. One of my best favorite friends and people is Bob Berg, who is the co-author of The Go-Giver, which is a really uh, highly ranked business book. Bob has been on our show, just so you know, Corey. So you know what a wonderful guy he is. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I was, I'm a member of Bob's uh, coaching team, you know, a certified go-giver coach. And one of the things that Bob taught me was the idea of telling stories and writing blogs. And Bob was really helpful when I first started writing blogs. And so what I would do as therapy for me is essentially there would be something that would happen at the pharmacy and there would be something that would happen as to way somebody reacted at the pharmacy or in the main store because I worked for a huge department store at the time uh, and I would write a story about it but you know changing the names and changing uh, the situation so to protect the people that were involved and I would essentially write either how I handled it or how I think it should have been handled. And uh, these blogs really, even though they were pharmacy specific, were really well received because what happened is that people can always say, you know what, I had a boss that was that same way. Like, for example, the day the boss told me that when you rate an employee too high, he's going to think he doesn't have room for improvement. So you should rate them lower uh, because you want them to want to strive to be better. And I was I was flabbergasted by that. I was like, no, no, the truth is that if you rate an employee too low, he's going to say, no matter what they do, it doesn't matter. And mm. so I write these blogs, and Bob said to me, you know what, you really need to take these blogs and turn them into a book. And so what we did is we created a framework around a district manager named Cynthia who was based on a district manager that I actually had and we we showed how she was really uh, struggling to engage her employees and we hooked her up with a mentor named Otis who showed her how to take that 32 percent engagement that she had and really ramp it up at the time I had a 97 percent employee engagement rate and I really wanted other pharmacists other management professionals to understand how we got our employees so engaged and one of them you already mentioned was what we called the law of the contribution why does my job matter and what we did was we went ahead and we did a survey on SurveyMonkey and we surveyed our target audience and we said what really gives you the most work satisfaction and we listed payroll and we listed benefits and we listed some other things but far and away the one that the women that we surveyed chose was the ability to make a meaningful contribution it was like 67 percent chose that one and I was kind of blown away so I went back to work and I asked the girls that I worked with why would that be and without missing a beat one of them said look it's the only thing that makes it worth the guilt of leaving your family to come to work, to provide for them. Mm. And I got it. You know what, Ken, you and I are in the information service age. People have a difficult time finding a tangible, this is what I do. We don't make windshields as a rule anymore. We are serving people. So giving people real tangible jobs and real tangible tasks that they can be proud of here you're in charge of the schedule this is your schedule we'll teach you how to do it we'll empower you to do it and then we're going to stay out of it we're going to go ahead and oversee it only if you're out sick or if there's a problem Mm. and what we found was when you do that people really love to take ownership of their own projects and their own ability to create a meaningful contribution even in a small pharmacy within a huge building within a huge company and so that's how the law of the contribution was born and so we had seven laws that we wrapped the successful thinker around and what we found was if you could just do these seven things no matter how busy you are no matter how stressful your job is 
all of a sudden you create your own environment. You create a different story around your workplace. Mm. And it's been I don't know if we have time to go through all seven, but let's just go through them. Oh, I can do it pretty quickly for you. So the second one is the law of the story, which basically says that if you want a better life, you have to tell yourself a better story about your life. For example, suppose you're going to go to a movie at the mall. And it's raining and you drive over to the mall and you can't find a parking space close to the mall. So you end up parking out in Timbuktu. Well, now you've got two opportunities. You can complain and whine about how you got all wet and you couldn't find a parking space close. And you can wreck the whole movie by doing that. Or you can laugh and joke about how you got stuck in the rain and how you had a chance to, you know, get a refreshing breath of fresh air and a nice walk to the mall. Same outcome, same movie but a totally different experience, right, based on how you mm -hmm. choose to explain it. And as you well know, successful people are better at explaining their life to themselves than unsuccessful people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the third law was called the law of the agenda. One of the things that happens in corporations is can you have an agenda when you show up for work today of things that you need to get done, that you want to get done, or things that are important to you in your work. And when your boss comes in and steamrolls your agenda, you feel cheated, you feel angry, you feel hostile. So what we did is we said, what if you as a manager were able to work within the agenda of your employees? So if you get a directive from above you that says, you got to have this accomplished by Thursday, you don't turn around and say, okay, you're doing this by Thursday. You're saying, you know what, we as a team have an agenda. We have to meet by Thursday. What do you think is the best way to go about it? And so you're actually approaching a directive as a team. Mm -hmm. we, we said that there was such a thing as a law of the connection. One of my favorite books is a book by John Maxwell that is called Everybody Communicates, Few People Connect. I met Bob Berg through John Maxwell because I'm also a John Maxwell coach. And what John said is that you have the ability to connect with your employees or you have the ability to communicate with them. So we recognize that when you have an employee, you want to care about them, you want to add value to them, and most importantly, you want to know them. Because we both know that the number one factor in whether a person will quit a job is their immediate supervisor. And it's because they don't feel known, they don't feel understood, they don't feel trusted, and they don't trust them. So we worked on how do you communicate in a way that makes people feel connected with. And it's okay to learn about your people. Most people make the mistake of thinking that if you care too much about your employees, you're going to lose authority. But you won't lose authority because what happens is that everybody knows who's in charge as soon as something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. The Law of the appreciation was a direct result of my conversation with that manager who told me to rate people lower. What we said is that if you don't make people feel appreciated, you're making people feel underappreciated by default. And we said that if people feel appreciated, it's amazing what they will do. Mm. Now, I told you that one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was read books. So we created the law of the student. And in the successful people, in the back, is a list of the 12 books that we use to craft this along with our personal experience and the personal experience of the 30 or years of talking to customers about what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And finally, one of the saddest experiences I ever had was when a customer of mine passed away and his wife asked me to go to his funeral. And I went there and there was three people there, including his wife. And what happened was that her best friend had put together a laptop presentation with a slideshow, and it showed all the things this guy liked, dogs, trucks, but there was no people in it. And his wife told me that Rick didn't like people. He just didn't. And so consequently, people didn't like him. And so we created the law of the heart, which essentially said that the more you care about people, the more people you will have in your life to care about. And I have found that one of the best investments of our time and energy is just caring about people, kindness, worrying about to some degree how you are received by other people and do you help people 
or do you just use up the resources of the world, of the place you work? And I have found, at least for me and the people that seem to enjoy my book, that when you care about the people in your life and the people that you can impact and influence, everything changes for you. So mm-hmm. that in a that in a in a tight wrapper is the seven laws of twenty first century leadership. You did that. You did that very well, Corey. Just uh, ramped her up, and away you went. Well, so, thank you. Uh, I I, I, <laughs> I appreciate that, and you know those are um, certainly uh, wise words as far as all the different components. And you know that's pretty cool that you've connected with Bob. And you know Bob has several uh, books, the whole Go Giver series, right? Absolutely. And one of the things that Bob prides himself in is his ability to turn an adversarial situation into a positive event. He actually had written a book from uh, adversaries into advocates, and it was a tremendous book. Uh, on, on I really admired Bob's ability to recognize that whenever you come into a situation, let's say uh, you're getting bumped off your airplane and you got to get a, a, a flight, you can walk up to the other person and you can create a stressful situation to them or you can create a situation where that person wants to help you. So like one of the things that has really shaped my life is let's say you go out to eat and and you're having a wonderful time and you're saying please and thank you and thanks for your service and things to the waitress and the table next to you is having a terrible time and then you have the same waitress and they're treating her lousy and 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 it's funny how to me how people don't always understand that sometimes you're creating that experience for yourself and Bob was really what I want to call instrumental in, in, in really helping me round that out and really understand it. And Bob did a a nice thing for me. He proofread The Successful Thinker, and he helped me with some suggestions and some changes to make it an even better book. And uh, I I just feel like I owe the man the world, and I really enjoy Bob because one of the things about him is he's very careful with people. And I think one of the things that you mentioned, you know, I think the problem with the media right now is we're not being very careful with people. Mm. And... And I think that you find that people being emotional beings, when you're not careful in how you speak to them and how you speak with them, employees, your family, your customers, that's when things go wrong. And you have the ability then to say, oops, I wasn't careful. Now what Mm -hmm. are we going to do with this space I've created? And a lot of people bury their head in the sand and try to pretend it didn't happen. Instead, it's, you know what, Ken, I'm sorry. Mm. Well, one of my friend, one of my friends wrote the book. Um, it's just come out. Oh, it's, I'm just trying to remember the subtitle, but it's something about you know what is it to be human. And his um, his work is around genocide. And said, so how does that happen? He says, well, that's because people don't see people as people. They see them as you're a dog, you're a rat, you're a cat. And so his whole doctorate work was around how we dehumanize individuals and when you do that then you see the atrocities that occur out there because you're not human you're something else right you're not from my tribe you're not from this group whatever and what you're talking about is the opposite and the opposite is really uh, being more inclusive it was interesting my daughter just you talked about your son's 18th birthday my daughter when we're recording this show just had her wedding um, just over a month ago and her husband and my new son-in-law one of the things that he has, he just has this network of friends everywhere. And um, part of that is just his number one priority is the people. It's just the connection with the people, reaching out to them, hanging out with them. As an individual who is over 30 and still single, he just had this whole tribe of people around him. And it's interesting how I just really was thinking, you know, thank you for your book about that and how did he achieve that and that is because the relationships with these people are most important and pretty well everything else doesn't matter <laughs> so, so your 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 story is demonstrated by some examples in my life already oh wonderful because at the end of the day when you really read philosophy and you read about the buddha and things regardless of your religion or your creed or anything everyone is facing something. Mm 
You know, and, and when you realize that while I'm talking to you, you just said it, you have a daughter, you have a son-in-law, which means that at some point in your life you had a spouse and you have friends and you have concerns and you have a house and you have all these things. So you're not only just talking to Ken, the podcaster, or you're not only working with Candace, the technician. You're working with a whole sphere of things going on. Mm -hmm. And it's really critical to recognize, and I think as a pharmacist, I really have seen this firsthand. If you think that you're the only person taking antidepressants or anti-anxiety medicines or uh, Nicorette to to quit smoking, what you'll find is that nearly everybody is in rough shape and nearly everybody is struggling with something. At some point, we all become a hot mess. And it's really that time in your life that can really shape for you, you know, maybe I've put more into things than I should have. And maybe if I put more into people, I'll recognize that at the end of the day, like you said, not a lot else matters. And Mm. so one of the things that really formulates my particular philosophy of life is, you know, sometimes it's easy to get upset over stupid little things. But if it's not going to matter in five years, I don't spend more than five minutes on it now. Well, one of my, I don't want to call it a favorite word, but one of the words that comes out of my mouth is, oh man, they've been so petty. So uh, it's it's amazing what some things that will upset certain individuals and uh, I'm more just shocked by it. But as you said, there's something behind that that's driving that for them. It could be an insecurity, could be depression, could be, I was thinking about a family member who just went went berserk and uh, they were off work on anxiety disorder for a year, right? Just because they were just so, they had stressed themselves so much that anything would set them off. So, uh, so, okay, don't take it personally. That's part of that where we always have a choice on how we respond. Do we not, uh, Corey? Well, that's the whole thing. I mean, you have to recognize, you know what? If I want to be the best version of myself, I have to allow people the space to be the worst version of themselves. And Mm. when you can do that and say, okay, okay, let's have it. Let's have the whole thing. Okay, now, how can we work to improve that situation? What would have to be true for you to feel better about the mess that you just shared with me? What are our options? See, at the end of the day, most things aren't nearly as bad as we think they are. Mm. And a lot of things that we really put a lot of emotion to are really just mental constructs. Well, it goes back to your book about how do we think about it? Am I in the parking lot and saying, oh, man, I can't believe I got caught in the rain and have some fun with it, or just be miserable and all upset over the fact that you can't control the rain? Exactly. One of the funniest times I've ever had in my life, the hardest I've ever laughed, is there was a day about a year and a half ago, I'll never forget it, I was going to make pancakes, and I went to break an egg, and this egg exploded all over the kitchen. And I don't know what it was, but I just started laughing hysterically. And my wife comes down and she's looking at me like I'm insane and I'm laughing hysterically. And the funny part is that I cleaned it up and it was just so funny. But being angry or upset about it doesn't put the egg back together. The egg Mm. is still broken, right? Mm -hmm. So everything works that way. Even things that are serious have potential benefits that you would never see coming. I'll tell you the story. I was fired. I was ruthlessly fired from a hospital job. And you would think that that is a bad thing, right? Except that I noticed that I felt better before I got to my car. That opened the door to the job I have right now where I just absolutely love. And so what you have to recognize is that none of us are smart enough to recognize the universe's plan. None of us are smart enough to predict the future. But what happens is to the people that are successful in life is they recognize that no matter what happens, it's a door to somewhere else. So like I know a person who's working on his third marriage, and it's the best marriage of anyone I know, but he couldn't have had that third marriage if he didn't go through the second one 
because he would have been in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong circumstances. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, if you can believe it, Corey, we're almost to the end of our show. And before we get your closing remarks, how can people uh, find out about you and or get your book? Well, so going to thesuccessfulthinker.com is where all my stuff is. Right now, we're giving away the book for free. I ask that people pay for shipping because, as we said, I'm still a working guy just like everyone else. But we do give the book away for free, and there's several places that you can click. You can listen to my podcast, The Successful Thinker, and, and just really get a feel for who I am and what I'm trying to do. Hmm. Well, thank you for that, uh, Corey. Now, you know, as we wrap up uh, in the show, I mean, just the, the time has already come here as we just have in this conversation, and we should be sitting across each other having a coffee, or if you drink beer, then you can do that is uh, what would you like to leave the audience with in terms of your final thoughts today? Well, I think really what you and I talked about that really speaks to my heart right now is really trying to expand that space between what happens in your life and how you respond to it and really trying to open up a bigger space for people to be people and that even goes for people that you don't like in the media. Recognize that no matter who your choice is for, let's say, president, for instance, because right now it's the election year, recognize that that person is more than what the media portrays them to be. They are everything that's ever happened to them, everything that they're going through now, and everything that's going to happen to them. And really just make a space for people, because if you do that, you'll find that your own life will improve in ways that you never before thought possible. Mm, mm. Well, Corey, thanks for hanging out with us today. Very much appreciated. Oh, I really had a great time, and, and I hope we added some value to your audience. Well, that is uh, for sure. So stay with us, Corey. And uh, for Secrets of Success listeners, it's thesuccessfulthinker.com. And uh, Corey also has a podcast, and that's on Apple Podcasts. And are there other platforms you're on as well? All of the big ones. All the big ones. Okay, so go anywhere there to find that. You know, my encouragement is, as Corey has said in his book, in his seven steps, is that, and you know what, this is good for me, because man, do I need it, is just to say that in any given situation, you have a choice about how you're going to respond. You have a choice about the attitude you're going to bring. Are you going to treat that person with respect or kindness or not? And I could be accused of, I haven't always done that in every situation. And then am I really going to give myself the benefit of the doubt or reframe something so that it's more positive than negative, as Corey has said. So thank you as always for being a Secrets of Success listener and giving us your most valuable commodity, your time. If you like what we're doing, please share, pass it on, uh, leave a positive comment on whatever platform you're listening on. Thank you for listening to Secrets of Success. I'm your host. Dr. Ken Keyes. Thanks for exploring the secrets of success with us. If you want to keep the momentum going, log on to crgleader.com. Scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails. You can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.